Beginning of our 10th year uh, as a church in the Mountain Home community in North Central Arkansas. Uh, I've never just been kind of, I never figured God called me to a town. I figured God called us to a region because we have that kind of impact. Amen. And I say we as in us as the body, the church, we have that kind of impact, uh, and I'm excited about what's going to happen next. For some of you, we're going to go over this in a couple of weeks, but I just want to celebrate with you a little bit. In the first 10 years, we saw 569 first-time people say yes to Jesus Christ in their life. We baptized over 706 people, around 710 people, uh, and uh, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed that God would allow us to be a part of that, and especially when you begin to see the averages. In a nation where evangelism, baptism, salvations have declined for the last 10 years, and in the last four years, they're declining by a 25% rate. Four years, that means in 12 years, if we continue the trend, There'll be no more salvations and baptisms in our nation. But not here. We refuse. We refuse to be good. We refuse to settle. And uh, you guys know the value that we teach here is that we are never finished. And so you have a neighbor, you have a child, you have a parent, you have an aunt, an uncle, a niece, a nephew, a co-worker, a co-student. You have somebody around you every day that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We live in a community, a county of 40,000 people, and roughly 76 to 78% claim no religious affiliation at all. Where our location is in Ozark County in Missouri, 80% of Ozark County does not claim any kind of religious affiliation. There's, there's work to be done. The fields are ripe with harvest, but we have to have the right attitude, amen? We, it, 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 you got to kind of own it that it's got to be you. And I have to stop or I'm going to preach a sermon that I ain't ready to preach yet. And so, but we got to own that fact. Today I'm going to talk, I want you to, I want to listen as the passage that I read out of the book of Galatians. Uh, the two, what I call small books in the New Testament, Galatians and Colossians, are quickly becoming my favorite New Testament letters. Uh, I just love the simplicity of them, but also the straightforwardness of them. And so we're going to be in Galatians today, chapter 6. If you have your Bible, you can track with us. If not, it's going to be on the screen. To our, uh, our guests that are here today with us, we wanted to say thank you for coming out today. If you're here and you're local in the area, you can just quit looking, hang out here. We're going to do awesome things for Jesus. We're going to watch him do amazing things. If you're passing through, then I give you this challenge. Whatever God does in your soul today, because I'm expecting him to do something. But whatever he does in your soul today, I pray you take it back to your home church and you kick the back doors open and let the world know that Jesus Christ still saves do that today for us. That is our goal. That is my heart for you. Galatians chapter 6. It says, do not be misled. We're going to be in verse 7. Do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Can I get an amen on that, church? Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. And I want you to kind of lean into verse 9. This is where we're going to live today. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. And at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Look at the neighbor on your right and say, can't stop. Say it loud, church. Say, can't stop. Now I want you to look at the person on the other side of you, even if you don't know them well, and say, won't stop. And that has to be the attitude that you and I have with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad that Jesus saved you? Say amen. amen. How many of you know he's not done saving those around you? Amen. That attitude. That can't stop, won't stop kind of attitude that says, you know, I'm going to go after it. And I want to reap this harvest of blessing. But the greatest blessing is not that I can pay all my bills. That's a good one. Some of you still reeling from Christmas. But that's a good one, but that's not the ultimate blessing to reap. The ultimate blessing to reap are those people that are not sitting next to you yet. That's the ultimate blessing to reap. Because one day when Jesus comes, you don't get to take the bills with you. Somebody said, amen. (laughs) Praise Jesus. But you can. This is the one blessing, the one thing that I love that Jesus did, that God set up in the plan, is that of the things I don't get to take with me, 
It's okay, I'm going to miss them, and I probably aren't, I'm probably not going to miss them. But the thing I can take with me is the person that's, that's beside me. I can lead my family in a way where I can take my family to heaven with me, that they'll get the opportunity to go. I can lead in a community. I can, I can lead in McDonald's. I can lead in Walmart. I can lead at the school. I can lead in those places at a level that people will seek to follow the message that I have. What a blessing if we don't give up. If we don't give up. I'm going to tell you, it's become easy to give up. We start to shrug and go, well, what can we do? We can give the gospel. We can give the message. We, we, can, we can serve people. We can be there for folks. We can pick up the phone. We can stretch out our hand. We can do a lot of different things. But we've been taught. I, I don't know if taught's the right word, but maybe culture is shifting to a place where even us as believers, we kind of feel like we have to walk like this so we don't mess anything up. I was trying to think of how to word it this morning, and, and I was sitting there going, because we live in such an offended culture. How many of you are tired of the word offended? And, and we're sitting there trying to figure out how we tell people. We want to tell them, but we don't want them to be offended. Well, here's the reality. And please don't use this anywhere else, okay? Because it's only going to make sense if you're in the house, and you know me, and you love me, and you trust me. But you can either be offended, or you can go to hell. See? You got you to gotta really choose where you use that because, <laughs> I mean, uh, I didn't write that in my notes because I was afraid somebody might read it. <laughs> That's the options out there. We're afraid to tell people about a Jesus that can radically change their life, that can change everything about their life. It can make the, their marriage stronger, their parenting better, their job goes smoother. You say, God, Vince, I don't know if Jesus has all that. To, then you don't know him like I know him. But if I'm going to stop just shy of pressing someone, you say, well, Vince, I just want to be that Christian that, you know, people can watch me and they can see the love of Jesus pour out of me. How are you doing in that? Like, because if that's your plan, if that's the go-to, if that's, that's where you're going to land, then you better check yourself in the drive throughs because you're going to have to be on 24-7 if, if your life is the only witness that you have. The Bible says to proclaim, how will they know if they don't hear, and how will they hear if there's not somebody to proclaim it, a preacher. You say, that's you, that's the preacher. No, the word is to proclaim it, that's you, Amen. yours children. They gotta hear it, so that we gotta be bold and we gotta step across some lines. I always think, I always get tickled. The first thing that always snaps into my mind when people go, well, I, I wanna be a Christian, but I want, don't wanna be offensive. I always go to Jesus when he looks at Peter and he calls him Satan. Like, try that one with one of your friends. <laughs> Hey, is Satan, um, not your spouse. Don't do it with your spouse. That won't go well. But we've got to be willing. There's got to be an attitude about us. I don't mean an arrogance about us. There has to be an attitude about us that says, no, I can't stop and I won't stop. I can't stop and I won't stop. I want to reap this harvest of blessing, but if to, in order to reach, it's a conditional word. That two little word of if is a conditional word. If, if we don't give up, we will reap this great harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And too many, too long, too often the church has expected a great blessing of harvest. And we gave up. We stopped trying to reach the ones that we knew were broken. We stopped trying to reach the one. We started trying to pick who might be good in our church or, or who might be. I, I, well, I don't know if I want them to come to church. I said this with a group of people in our, in, uh, the other night. I was meeting with them, and I said, here's the reality of us. Is the reality is that if we get really bone honest with ourselves, there may be some people in our life that we're really not concerned whether they go to heaven or not because of something they've done to you in your past. And you've got to the place where you're like, well, I want them to go. And no, I don't know if I really do or not because if you really want them to, you'll tell them. You'll tell them. Why? Because we can't stop and we won't stop. The gospel isn't done. Jesus hasn't blown the horn yet. He hasn't stepped out to take us home, and so we are not finished. So I want to dive into this idea because the attitude matters. John Maxwell says this, people will hear your words, but they will feel your attitude. 
They will feel your attitude. And I, I don't believe that he's done. I believe that God has a plan for you. How many of you believe that God has a plan for you? How many of you, how many of you believe it's something big? A lot of people don't. A lot of just figure, well, God's plan for me was that I got saved and that was good. No, he has a purpose for you and it's good. It's good. God doesn't do anything. And if you read what he does and you see the plans that he worked out in people's lives, we got to grasp onto this idea that God has something big for us. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. Because God has given us a new way, and that new way got me an eternity. And because I'm thankful for that eternity, I don't have an option for giving up. So today I want to talk to you about why we quit. I could rah-rah and I could do all that kind of stuff and I, I, like, I love pep talks, believe me, it's kind of, I love him. But we got to figure out where the issue is. Why do we quit? Why do we stop? Why do we accept slowing down? Why do we get into this rut as Christians that just goes, well, I think I've told enough people. We haven't yet. We haven't yet, because the moment you stop telling a little bit, your kids will stop telling a lot. This is a leader principle that what you do in moderation, those who follow you will do in excess. And so if you just moderately love Jesus, your children will push away a lot because he's not been seen as the main thing in your life. If Jesus is optional to you, or the things of Jesus is optional to you. Why would it even be on the radar of those that follow? Can't stop. Won't stop. I'm going to be a grandpa in March. Yeah. Hey, y'all say what you want. What God did is put another arrow in my quiver that I have to figure out. What, what I have to do is I have to figure out a way to prepare the way to set that child up to win, to know who Jesus Christ is. I want to I wanna spoil them rotten. I want to do crazy stuff and buy them outfits that say, my grandpa, actually, I'm going to go buy Big Papa because <laughs> I want a rap song as my theme. And so for those of you that get it, you get it. Those that you don't, I'm sorry. But I'm going to buy her tacky t-shirts because she's going to be a little girl and that just means I win. But of all the tacky grandpa things I'm going to do, the great harvest of blessing will not be the onesie that's cute. It will be when she walks into heaven with me. Yes. I can't stop. I won't stop. I can't stop. I won't stop. If, if this church is your home and this is where you choose to do mission out of, then the attitude I need you to have in 2021 isn't, well, we made it through last year. I, it's done. It's gone. We only get to hear about it on the news and on calendars and in pictures. But from this point forward, I can't stop and I won't stop. Why? Because someone is depending on me to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if I'm going to reap this great harvest of blessing, which I hope I do, and every one of you, whether you admit it or not, you want to reap the harvest. Of, we want blessing. Don't forget the condition of not giving up. So why do we quit? First reason we quit is we get overwhelmed. The beginning of verse 9 says, says, so let us not get tired of doing what is good. I think most people this last year had anywhere from two to three months of weird, okay? And I'm only referencing this to prove a point. In those couple months of weird, you didn't do the same things, but you got more tired. There were times this last year that I was exhausted, and I turned around and I looked, and I felt like I didn't do much. But I was tired just from the mental strain and stress that was going on and the, some of the emotional stuff that had happened. We lost dear friends this last year. And, and you start to get tired. And, and when we start to get tired is when we kind of start to back off the mission. We start to back off the mission. When we get overwhelmed, we get we're tired. Nobody likes it tough. Say amen, church. I know my dad used to, I used to get tickled at him, but he would always talk about growing up, hard work, hard work. Got to work hard. My dad worked hard. He retired from Sears. He was an appliance repairman, electrician, heating and air guy, and pastor. 
and did all, I mean, so it was constant. Like he'd get out of his Sears truck at night, walk in, change his shirt, he'd keep his gray work pants on, change his shirt to something that matched or did not match, it didn't matter to my dad. And he'd go on to Bible study and teach a Bible study or go on to visitation and he'd go visit people and it was constant and he always talked to us about working hard. And I got tickled because there was a time in Michigan just before we moved to Arkansas that he got an automatic wood splitter. And I said, I don't think this is working hard. You just lay it up there and he started laughing because he realized the, uh, uh, the irony of work hard, work hard, work hard, but let's make it as easy as we can. Guys, here's the thing. Yeah, somebody said work smarter. I think that's, that's ultimately the goal for all of us. But here's the thing. If you figure out how to work smarter, it doesn't mean that you work less. You just work different. When we get tired, we work less. And the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't have room for less. The people that you know that don't know Jesus, they don't have room for you to stop. They don't have time for you to quit. This last week, a dear friend of mine, 52 years old, he got diagnosed, he got a positive test on Monday, and Thursday at 5 o'clock he died. Thanks be to God, he knew Jesus Christ. But there are those that don't. They don't have time for us to stop or quit. They don't have time for us to be tired and take a day off. But Vince, that's not how, no, I'm not saying you can't rest along the way, but even in the rest, be ready. Even in the rest, be ready for what God wants to do in you because so often when we get into this thing of we're tired, we're tired, we're tired, it becomes, and please hear my heart in this because I get, I get winded also, but when we, get, we make it an excuse that we're tired or I just got so much going on, what we immediately do is we begin to bring the gospel down our priority list. And the gospel is not something that goes on your priority list. It should be something that permeates your priority list. Your family, your life, your job, your home, all those things shouldn't be okay and then we'll tack in church in the gospel. No, 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 no. The gospel should be in all of those things. I want my kids to know that I have a lot of fun, that I will destroy them in a Nerf war if it comes to it. That I will dance with them in the kitchen. That I will make FaceTime calls to my daughter and we will laugh and we will giggle and we'll do all the fun stuff. But ultimately at the end of this life, no matter how tired I am from doing fun stuff with them, they have to know that I love Jesus Christ above all. Even when I'm tired, they have to know that. That he is, he is the priority for not only me, but for this home. We get overwhelmed with the situations that we're in rather than being overwhelmed with the provision we know is coming. You realize that? If I were to ask you how many of you know God is a good God, say amen. It's a no-brainer. Even if we don't know it, we know it's the Sunday school answer to the question, right? I'm supposed to say Jesus here. Yes, he's a good God. He, uh, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. I know the mantras. I know the cliche stuff. But the reality is if God is a good God and we know he is a good God, why do we stop believing that in our bad times? That's when we get tired. That's when we get tired. We get overwhelmed. Starts to mess with us a little bit. I know you're going to have circumstances in this coming year because you're going to have them in the year to follow that. You had them before 2020 showed up, all of that. You, you're going to get tired this year. You're going to get winded this year. Find a way to have godly rest so that you're ready, so that you're ready when the opportunity comes up. Are you going to share the gospel? And when the opportunity comes up, are you going to pray with somebody that needs it? When the opportunity comes up, are you going to set yourself aside so that the gospel can be forefront? Is that what's going to happen? Or are you going to default to the excuse of I'm so tired? It's got so much going on. I will say this to anybody on the planet, regardless of their station. There is nothing more important than someone knowing Jesus. So if we get tired doing the other stuff, then we've missed the mission. We've just missed it. Second thing that makes us tired isn't not only when we get overwhelmed, I like this one, but it's when we can't control it. <laughs> uh, I won't ask about control freaks in the house because some of you won't raise your hand. 
The Bible also says at verse 9, And at the right time, be not weary in doing well, because at the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing. And most people hate that part of the verse. Because it, tell us, it won't tell us when we reap the blessing. It just says at the right time. And how many of you know you don't get to pick the right time? God picks the right time. And we struggle with that. Burger King says, have it your way. And it's still wrong. <laughs> Not all the time. I'm pretty, I like to think that I'm not controlling I like to think that I'm not that much of a control freak. How many, let's just test the waters here a little bit. How many of you have kids say amen? How many of you asked them to do the dishes ever in their life say amen? How many of you, once they did the dishes, you went back and redid the dishes? Okay. Not necessarily because they weren't clean, but because they didn't do them like, like you do them. How many of you know how to fold a towel correctly? Nobody does. <laughs> My kids are learning the fold, fold, trifold method. Where you fold it in half, you fold it in half, then one, two, three. Hey, can I get an amen on that? That's how they're going to fold them in heaven. I'm not sure if you knew that or not. I, don't, I, I mean, I, I can get you the scripture somewhere. I'll figure it out. But... Uh, I, I didn't know, my mom folded towels that way, and luckily I married someone that when I started folding towels, like, Jennifer is an acts of service person, that's her love language, um, she's not physical touch, she's not gifts, she's not, any, she's acts of service, like, I could get her flowers every day of the week, but if I do the dishes, she's like, dun, dun, dun. like, I, I won that day, right, so when we got married, and I was folding some laundry or watching TV, and I folded a towel, like, it was literally this matrix moment for her, she thought she might not have been in this, mo she looked at me, and she just stared for a minute, and I got, I got scared, <laughs> she didn't mean anything bad by her, it wasn't like a bad stare, but husbands, how many of you know that sometimes when they just look at you, like, you know they're thinking about a million things, and we only have the capacity to think about, like, half a thing, and so when she was staring at me, I thought, oh, no. She's like, who taught you to fold towels? I'm like, my mama taught me how to fold with the towel. What do you Did I do it wrong? She's like, no. <laughs> you did it right. I called my mom. I'm like, we won. We did it. So... <laughs> But if you do that, if you go into situations, so often we do this about God, we, we come into, we'll get to an altar, we'll get in time of devotion, we'll get renewed or inspired, we'll be like, God, whatever you want me to do, how, I'm here, I'm yours, Lord, lead me, guide me, direct me, what is it you want me to do? This. About that. Like, I, th I mean, that's cool, and I can probably get there, but could I start, like, over here doing this? Because we wanted our way. We wanted our way. I wanted to be an evangelist. I wanted to travel around and preach. Just show up in an RV, get to blow in, blow up, and blow out. Like I could tell people literally in that kind of situation, you can either get offended or go to hell and then walk out and be like, good luck with that, pastor, and do that kind of stuff. Like, that's what I wanted. That was my desire. Because I kept telling God, God, I'm not wired to pastor people. Like, I, I, don't, I, run, I run too fast, and sometimes I, I don't look back. And so there are people in the wake that I forget. I, I'm not good at returning calls. I'm not good at the organizational stuff. So, Lord, I know you created me to be visionary, to go after the world. And I want to save the entire world. And I can do that from an RV if you'll let me. God, let's do it that way. And then five weeks after I said, God, I'll preach, he made me a pastor. Like a, like a full-time pastor. I, didn't, I was so green, I didn't know what I was doing. And they told me that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Had deacons stop me every Sunday. And it, man, I love that dude. He's still one of my favorite people on the earth. He said, you know what? I know you love preaching the whole counsel of God's word. I said, that's right. That's what we're supposed to do. Preach the whole counsel of God's word. He said, you just don't have to preach at all. Every Sunday. <laughs> like, just take a piece of it. Because I was preaching an hour and a half every Sunday hour and a half, literally 90 minutes after the last song. We'd have three services here, buddy. We'd be here till four o'clock in the afternoon back then. See, I was doing it my way. Luckily, God put me, or I wanted to do it my way, and God said, no, no, no. I need to, I need to form you 
I need to make you into what? Because you don't know what's coming. You don't know where I'm going to put you. God, I want it my way. I want to, I want to do it. I want to do it like I want to do it. And so often, here's the, the problem. The rub is that in faith, in this idea of not having it my way, I don't have to have the destination. I just have to have the faith to take the next step. And too many of us want to know where we're going. Now you're listening. You pay attention. <laughs> Stay right here with me, folks. <laughs> we want to know where we're going. And because we don't know where we're going, we refuse to move from where we are instead of just taking a step into what could be next. What could be next? I said, God, I'm, all right, you want me to pastor? I'll pastor. Man, I pastored a little church in Melbourne, Arkansas. We had a ball, had a blast. It was good. Got there, it's a group of about 36 people. We were loving Jesus, loving the Lord, and we'd see new people coming every week. About three years in, we were running about a night and about 90, close to 100 people. We'd baptize down the White River at Gyne, and man, it was great, great stuff. Just saw some good stuff happen. I'm like, okay, this must be what God wants me to do. And God said, hey, it's time for you to go. I got something else for you. Like, no, I'm good. This is great. We'll just ride it out right here. I live right across the field from the church. I can walk over here. My kids love the area. It's a small town. I dig small towns. It's fantastic. He said, no, I'm going to need you to go someplace else. I don't want to go anyplace else. God, this works. I'm still doing your work. Isn't this good enough? And almost in that moment is where I got the whole understanding that God didn't call me to be good. He didn't want me to be a good person. He wanted me to be a God person. And God people are obedient. And so we stood up, and my wife and I wrapped our arms around each other, and we sing a tacky version of Friends and Friends Forever by Michael W. Smith to the church, and we rolled out. And I stepped into an environment where I had to learn to lead, not just preach. And God took me through that season. I thought, this is good. I'll just, when the pastor retires here, I'll just take over and I'll do this and I'll step in that slot and we'll be good. It'll be fine. The people love me. I love the people. It's a great area. It's close to some shopping, but it's not, you know, home. God said, no, no, I need you to go someplace else. I'm like, I don't want to go anyplace else. This is good. The church I was in before real life, the pastor met with me before I took over the church. And his words to me, his exact words to me were, just so you know, I've done everything that I can do to tear this place to the ground so that no one will put it back together. That, that was my welcome to ministry. And I stepped up into, I stepped into a broken situation. And I'm gonna tell you, it's the last place I wanted to be. See, I don't, I don't, I don't control it. I, I'm, I am the servant of God, I'm slave to Christ is what Paul says. That's who I am, and so whatever he calls me to do, it may not make sense, but I'm, I'm gonna go. It may not be what I wanna do, but I'm gonna go. I can't control the situations around me, but I get to control my responses, and so long as my responses are Jesus, I'm gonna be okay. You're not gonna be able to control it, so don't try. At the right time, you will reap a harvest. How many of you this year can go, you know what, I'll take a next step because I know at the right time the harvest is gonna come. I'll just take a next step. That may, next step may be serving somewhere. That may, next step may be just getting beyond sitting in a seat and taking up space. See, some of you might have got offended by that statement right there, but the reality is I can't stop and I won't stop and some of the things that we want to do, you're needed for us to do them. Get in the game. Get in the game. Be a part of how we go forward. Don't just, just ride with us. Be a part. And at the right time, you'll reap a blessing that you cannot describe. This last week, we were sitting here as a church staff, and I got a call and said, hey, I'm leaving Friday. I was like, okay. He said, but I, I didn't get a call. He came in and visited with me, a young man in the Air Force. He said, I, I'm leaving Friday. I'm going back to the station. I said, yes, sir. He said, and, and I've made the decision that I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And I said, that's fantastic. I'm pumped for you. He said, but I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized, and I want to be baptized before I go. 
I come out, I tell our team, hey, we got a baptism. They start to work. Boy, we get, the, we get the tub out. We get all this stuff out. Now, listen, we'd already cleaned for Sunday. We'd already got everything ready to go for Sunday. And now we got to bring the tub out and pull water across the floor and everything. You know, it wasn't what we wanted to do in that moment. But when you hear something that changes somebody's life, the gospel has had a moment that we get to be a part of the celebration. Some of you saw it on Facebook this week. We got to baptize Jasper. He's back home in Oklahoma snowing right now. <laughs> uh, We got to be a part, not because we got to do what we want to do, because God said, hey, you be open to whenever the gospel moves. And we took a step to believe that. And guess what? The gospel moved. And then we got to be a part of it. Hey, I want to take this step of baptism. He took a next step. And you know what? Then we got to take the next one with him. And then we all got to celebrate it. I don't know where Jasper's going to end up. I didn't see the destination. I don't know where we're going to end up. I don't know where you're going to end up. What I do know is right in front of you is a move that God is asking you to take. Will you? Will you? This year, will you be a God person and not just a good person? Well, the world has lots of good people. The God people are getting harder and harder to see. Be one. The last thing, we quit. We quit when we stop believing God for more. Real life church, when we started, I was painting a wall with a, with a lady and her and her husband and their family had decided to start the church with us. And we had just taken a pawn shop and tried to make it into a church building. We were painting a wall. And I was up on the ladder trimming out the ceiling and she was down on the floor paint, just rolling. And, and I heard her down here and she said, I can't wait. I said, what can't you wait for? She said, I can't wait to a real life church has like 40 or 60 people in it. And I just kept painting. I didn't know how to respond to it. I didn't know how to answer because I knew that God had called us to something. But I knew that there wasn't a limit or a lid to what God called us to. So I didn't want to discourage her in 40 or 60 because we had to get to 40 or 60 before we got to 80 or 100. We had to get to 80 or 100 before we could get to 500 or 700. We had to get to those numbers before God took us to 1,100 or 1,200. I, I, I didn't have a number on it. God, just whatever you want us to do. But I think so often we do that. We go, God, if we could just get to right here, we'd be good. When God is going, you have no idea that I was, I was planning on blessing you out here and you put the brakes on it. We stop believing God for more. We stop believing he's actually going to do the things he promised to do, that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that he will bless us, that he will pour out exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or even imagine on you. More than you can ask or even imagine, and we stop talking to him when we get by. We live so far under the blessing of God in our life because we just go, this is good enough. The God who created it all. Lord, if you'll just get us by. And most of us live with a, a Ferrari parked in our heart called the Holy Spirit. And we, all we do is we show people the keys. We never start the engine. Well, yeah, I got it. Is it good? Oh, it's, it's so good. It's so good. The problem is most of us know if we got in a car like that, it'd scare us a little bit. Same thing is true of the Holy Spirit in your life. Your next step, that can't stop, won't stop, is a full falling into. Jesus, where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to reach? What do you want me to do? Where is it, God? Where is it? I don't, I don't understand. Sometimes you're going to have moments like this. I see him here this morning, so I'm going to talk about him. I'm not going to say his name, but a few weeks ago, we had a young man saved in our bathroom here during church. Got up, God wrecked him. He got up, stepped out. Another fellow walked in there. The young man said, hey, can I talk to you? The guy said, hey, I'll try to find somebody that can talk to you. And the young man said, why can't I talk to you? And put him on the spot. God said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Your next step is not out of the bathroom. Your next step is to talk to this young man about who I am. And you know what? He stepped into it and he said, hey, you bet. We can talk. Let's do it. And was able to show Jesus to that person. See, 
good person could do either one. Good person, go find somebody. Hey, let me get somebody for you. That's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. But a God person stays in the moment till the next step is given by God. Can't stop. Why? Because your kids need Jesus. Because I have family that needs Jesus. I have friends that still need Christ. You have coworkers that need Christ. I can't stop. I, I'm, not, I'm not pulling back. I, I'm not, I'm not going to hit the brakes. And, and uh, No, no, no. We're gonna, we're gonna, we can't stop. We're going forward. There's a place that God, there's a destination just over the ridge that I don't have to see to know that God wants me to go there. I wonder in your life if you've stopped looking for what's over the ridge. I wonder if you've stopped believing that God can do more in your life than what's currently happening. Because I can promise you from experience, for those of you that were here on that first meeting in a bus garage, for that first service in a junior high, none of us anticipated what God has done thus far. None of us had a number of 700 baptisms or 500 salvations. None of us had a number like that. None of us believed like that. We just said, God, where do you want us to go? And he took us into it. I'm wondering, are you willing to walk with him into whatever's next I'm wondering if in your life you can say God I can't stop today and I won't stop today yeah they've told me I can't speak about Jesus here but we're going to go have coffee and talk about Jesus there they've said I can't do this in my workplace but I'll figure out how to have them over for dinner so that they'll know Jesus Christ I need to know that you're going to go with me I need to know that we get to go together I need to know and not only do I need to know heaven needs to know that you're in that you're in, that it's not just this. Well, we went to church. The devil's here every Sunday, believe me. He primarily sits in our sound system. <laughs> That's all I'm asking you. That's all I'm asking you is one step, one step. God, if you'll... If you'll show me the next one, I'll take this one. Will you take this one? Wherever you're at, I want you to bow with me, church. Wherever you're at. You may be doing this Christian thing. You may be serving someplace and you're doing good and you're active in the church. But you know deep in your soul that God is calling you to a next step. You may be brand new to this thing, and you can't, yes, you've been saved. Yes, you know that, that, that Jesus is the answer, but you've not been living for him. You stamped that card, said, man, I get heaven, so that's good. No, that's not what this verse says. It says there's work to be done. It says there's stuff. It says that if you want to reap the blessing, if you want to reap the great blessing, you got to not quit. It's not an option on the table to give it up. It's not, it's not something that we have. It's not a card we get to play to go, I'm out for a while. No, 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 no. We can't stop and we won't stop. So this morning, if you've stopped, now's the time to fix it. You come and lay that comfortable down on the altar. And you pick up a whatever it takes attitude. You come and lay down the, well, this is good enough attitude. And you pick up, I'm going to work till Jesus gets here. I'm going to go after it till Jesus gets here. And no excuse and no mountain and no obstacle is going to stop me. I'm going to work till Jesus gets here because I can't stop. I won't stop what Jesus wants to do in this world. For some of you, it's the shift between being a good person and being a God person. A good person does good things. The struggle with this one is because they're good things. A God person's obedient. And even when it doesn't make sense, they follow. This morning, church, where are you? can't stop, won't stop? Or let's just see how this thing goes for a while. Don't live there. You'll die there. So I'm going to give you one opportunity this morning. I'm not going to tarry, but I'm going to ask you. This morning you need to come forward and you need to lay down past bitterness and you need to lay down 
weariness and tired. And you need to lay down an attitude that said, I'm good. This is enough. If you need to do that this morning and pick up something different, then right now is the shot. Right now. Right now. You slide out of your seat, come lay it down, and leave it there. Leave it there. Father, this morning, I thank you. I praise you. I give you all glory and all honor. I thank you, God, that you called us to not just, not just be okay. You didn't challenge us with just making a decision. We, we've been challenged with the life to follow that decision. We've been challenged by this reality that there's more to do. There are people that are lost. There, there is a world that still needs saved and reached. There are even, God, in this county, even in this city, there are people that have stepped away the ch from the church and they're sitting there growing cold and indifferent when the gospel still needs to be preached and it still needs to be proclaimed. God, let us be a safe place for people to land and realize that the mission hasn't changed even though people mess it up. God, I, I let us be a place where there's restoration. Let us be the place where there's regeneration for the first time. Those that are lost will be found. God, those that are broken to be whole God, because we know that we at Real Life Church, we cannot stop and we will not stop until the mission is done. Until you step out of those clouds or you take us home another way, the mission continues. And Lord, whatever happened in the first 10 years, yes, we'll celebrate, but God, we're not resting on that. I'm expecting a greater 10 years than what we had. Lord, that which is before us is always going to be greater than that which is behind us. Let us not turn into a glory day's body where we keep looking back at what you've done and neglecting what you're doing. We ask all this. I pray, God, for those that have come that are just saying, God, ignite in me something new. Light a fire in me, God, for something new. Restore in me, God, this, this fervor in my salvation, this, this ache to chase after who you are. God, restore that in me. And then, Lord, let me run. God, let them run. Let them go get them all, God. Every person, every soul. Let us go after them with abandon. Because, God, we cannot stop. And, Lord, because of your grace and your mercy and your spirit living within us, we will not stop. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.